uh, today's uh, talk about the daily habits of the joyful. Certainly, uh, we talked last week about joy can be learned. You know, all the things we learn from, well, like our mom, our moms and dads, our uh, teachers, uh, mentors, uh, coaches, all those people we can learn things from. And last week, we talked about uh, uh, two people, uh, Timothy and Ephroditus, who had the qualities uh, of, of learned joy. They'd learned to have joy in their lives to the point to where Paul said, I have nobody else like him. And, and, and so uh, we think, well, man, what was, what, not, not only things we can learn, but maybe there were some habits in the life of Timothy and Ephroditus that set them apart in some ways because we know that knowledge certainly is important in gaining knowledge, in, in gaining knowledge and joy. If joy is a choice, then joy can be, be learned. Uh, but joy, uh, if it's, there's more important than knowledge, it's, it's also the behavior. It's also the actions. It's also the living out. So there's got to be some habits, some day-to-day -day habits that help us live in that joy, not only the knowledge, but, but, the, but the, the habits of that. I remember here, and I think it was Dave Ramsey, and talking about financial things and financial peace, maybe the book I read and things, and he says something like this. He said, most, th most things in life are 20% knowledge and 80% behavior. And, and I believe him in that. I think we need to be right on. Certainly the knowledge and truth is important, but we need to be, have, have the, the decision-making that is lived out, the, the, the behaviors that go with that. And so those are the, the habits. Habits are important things. Um, there are negative habits, which the Bible basically calls strongholds. And Paul in another book says I, you need to demolish every stronghold in Christ Jesus. You need to take captive every thought and demolish every stronghold. And so those are negative habits. But a positive habit in the Lord is a spiritual discipline. A positive habit could be something like opening your Bible and reading it each day or being in a prayer. These are spiritual disciplines that help uh, invite blessing and joy in your life as you trust him more. Now, Ralph Emerson, you know, one of our American uh, writers uh, from way back, uh, wrote this. He said, sow a thought and you reap an action. Sow an act and you reap a habit. Sow a habit and you reap a character. Sow a character and you reap a destiny. Did you know it just all starts with our decisions, all starts with our thoughts, and it moves in, in, into uh, decisions making, and, and then those move into actions, and enough actions in a row creates kind of a, a deeper uh, a path in our brain, which it becomes a habit, a good positive stronghold or a negative stronghold or, or positive discipline or negative discipline, and then that character, it becomes part of our character, and then it's really the decisions that lead to the outcomes of our life. Uh, and so it's important. These habits are important. Now, the world has all kinds of input on good habits uh, to form uh, and make a good uh, world experience for you to be successful and such. And so I was looking online. I just Googled, you know, habits for successful people. And this is what I got. One of them, you know, well, there were several. One was like 33 habits of successful people. One was like 20 of the best habits to be successful. Finally, I said, you know, I want a little shorter list. So I found the seven daily habits extremely successful people swear by. So we got it down to seven. So here, here if you want to be successful, listen carefully from the world here. Uh, these people, they read a lot, mostly nonfiction. I'd suggest the Bible, since they're reading nonfiction. Secondly, they meditate to clear their heads and stay sharp. So time meditation is a good, good habit. They get up early. I don't know if you think about that, good habit, bad habit. But they also manage to sleep a lot. Good habit, for sure. Uh, they make time for exercise. Well, they're probably a good, good habit. Uh, they're consciously working on their communication skills. All right? And then they include, including talking to themselves. Okay, so these people aren't crazy. They're talking, these are actually extraordinary, successful people you see walking around town talking to themselves. Probably a real positive talking thing. And so there's some good habits. So there you have the world has it for you, how to be successful in seven easy truths. And uh, memorize those, and, and uh, you'll be successful people. But really today, we not only want you to just be successful for this world and for this life, but we want you to be successful in, in knowing joy, really, that goes at a deeper level than the superficial life coach, uh, you know, success and finances and other skills and things. We want you to be successful for eternal purposes. Not just this world purpose, but for eternal purposes. And have a deeper truth that goes beyond the superficial, goes beyond what you can make for yourselves or what you'll make of yourselves in life, but really something that is, has a deeper application. And so we want habits for joy, not only for this world and this life, but to go beyond it. And that's what we find in Philippians chapter 3. Now, Philippians chapter 3, it's, it's a letter from Paul while he's in prison. And 
joy is written like 19 times in the books. And we know it's a book, and it's an affectionate joy, uh, an affectionate book written to the people of Philippi, a colony of Rome, while Paul's in prison. And so that's kind of the context in which he writes this. And I believe as we're reading chapter 3, we're going to cover a whole chapter, so we're going to cruise on this a little bit. But I feel like we can drive out five, or draw out five positive daily habits of the joyful. And then I didn't get this part. You're going to have to write this in your margins on your outlines today. But there's five negative traps or negative habits or strongholds that I would say that keep us from that daily joy, those daily joyful habits. And so uh, my computer crashed this week. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but some, I didn't get to some of the things I wanted to put in there in your bulletins. But we're going to read through uh, Philippians. We're going to read some verses, and then we're going to draw out the truth, and we'll, we'll move on in that way. Philippians 3, verse 1. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say you must be circumcised to be saved. For we worship by the Spirit of God, are, for we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised. We rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort. Though I could have confidence in my own effort, if anyone could, indeed, if others have reason for confidence in their own efforts, I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I'm a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real Hebrew if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become, rather I become a righteous, uh, righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with, with himself depends on faith. So Paul realizes right here at the end, he says, we're considered righteous, not because of what we've done, but because of our faith. We can wake up in the morning, know that God is smiling down on you, uh, because when he sees you, he sees Jesus because of your faith in him, because you've received him. And so if you've received him this morning, you need to wake up in this morning with a smile, knowing God is smiling down on you and saying, my son, my daughter, today is a new day, and I love you. And so what's the, what's the point in all this? What's the, a habit that we can kind of take in our lives and say, this is a good habit for joy daily? And here's the habit. We need to focus every day on relaxing in God's grace. Relax in God's grace. If we're to have joy in our lives, we ought to make the habit every day of relaxing in God's grace and His grace alone. Uh, we know from Ephesians, for by grace you've been saved through faith. It's a gift from God. So not of yourselves, so no one can boast. I'm not much of, into food critics and things, but there's this food critic I was reading uh, this week um, named Paul Greenberg, and uh, he wanted to eat out of the top 100 restaurants in the world, so a world traveler, and uh, he got to 99 restaurants, but he couldn't get to the 100th best restaurant in the world. It was in Tokyo, Japan, and the thing about this restaurant is it only has eight seats, and you have to be, it's a members-only restaurant or you have to be invited by a member. And so he's very frustrated. He's, he asked in the Wall Street Journal, anybody know who I can contact in order to get in this restaurant to try uh, the Sushi Sato restaurant? And, and uh, he's tried contacts with Golden Sachs, people up there, Morgan Stanley, other investment banks, American Express, all these contacts that have some membership there, and he still hasn't been able to get in. So he's asking for help. Well, the beautiful thing I see in this is you're either a member or you're not a member. You know, in 1 John it says, he who has the Son has life. He who does not have the Son does not have life. It's kind of this idea, the beautiful reason you can relax in God's grace is that you have a position in Christ Jesus where you are a member of his household. And it doesn't matter what kind of influence you may have in this world, people you might know, or efforts that you've made, or merits you've achieved. That doesn't matter at all because it's a gift of faith. And when you're in, you're in. 
says in Philippians 1, 6, he who began a good work in you is faithful to complete it until the day of Christ Jesus. He's the one that gives you the membership. He's the one that brings you in. And so you can relax in that and know he did it. He did it for you. And if you're in, you're in. And no one can take you from the hand of God. He knows his sheep. His sheep follow him. His sheep hear his voice. He gives them eternal life. Well, what's the negative habit or trap that we can fall into? What could possibly kind of, that needs that habit to counteract it? And I would say it's this, what Paul's talking about right here in Philippians 3. It is legalism. Everybody know what legalism is? Paul says there's a negative habit. It's a trap. Don't go there. He says in this verse, you got to watch out for those dogs. Who are the dogs? Who's, who he's talking about? He's talking about the Judaizers. The Judaizers, if you wanted to get more into that, you could read the whole book of Galatians, where he talks at one point to the people there, the new Christians there in Christ, used to be Jews, now they're, they're Jewish, but Christians, Messianic Jews, fulfilled Jews. And he says, man, who stepped in on your race? Who, who, who bewitched you to, to get you to try and do the things you thought you had to do as Judaism, whether that's a secret handshake, whether it's a certain religious ritual, you know, it, it, whatever it is to, to try and get in the club. He says, who's, who's trying to make you get in or do those things again? He's saying it's these dogs. They're the Judaizers that talk about things like, hey, there's no such thing as a free lunch. You gotta, you gotta earn it. If you want it, you gotta earn it. If you wanna get something done, you better get it done yourself. There's no free gifts. And so you got to learn the ritual. you got to learn the ceremony. In this, the Jewish law, you had to be circumcised. But Jesus says we have a, or, or Paul says we got a circumcision that's on our hearts and that we're in by faith. Many people, you know, are always trying to get you to do the things that they think in their eyes is what gets you right with God. And maybe sometimes you're in doing that to yourself. Well, I can't go to that church that, you know, the... The, the ceiling would fall down if they known all the things that I did and, and, and I've got to be a little bit, I've got to wash myself up, I've got to get clean before I can go to that church and things and, and there's a legalism flair that's entering in there. It's saying you've got to do this, you've got to do that and po Paul goes off on this basically saying, hey, nobody trying to accomplish something by works has tried to do that more than me. He's saying I was a Jew of Jews, I was a Hebrew of Hebrews from the tribe of Benjamin, a Pharisee. He was the one that was strict on the law. He was the, the religious elite I'd say for each day, we got to wake up in the morning this week and say, Lord, I just want to say thank you this morning for saving me. Thank you for saving me. That's the reality that I now get to live in and avoid the trap of legalism. And let me say this. There's, I've, never, I've never known a legalistic individual that is joyful. I, I've gone to some different churches and things. I would say they're borderline just on the way of legalism. And I'd say... I've never gone to a legalistic church where there's a sense or a spirit of joy there. You think that's what Christ wants? I said, no, absolutely, absolutely not. He said, well, how do you know whether you've fallen into legalism or not? I said, it's a simple question. It's a rhetorical question you can ask yourself. Are you more likely to criticize those around you when you're thinking about them in your mind, or are you more likely to want to encourage those around you? Simple question. What do you fall more into? What do you shade more to one side or the other you got to watch out for that it'll grab you subtly and it needs to be overcome by the habit of just resting and relaxing in the grace of the lord jesus christ now as we move on verse 7 it says i once thought these things were valuable all this stuff i've been trying to earn i once thought these things were valuable but now i consider them worthless because of what christ has done yes everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing christ jesus my lord for his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count on my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. Him saying counting it as all as garbage, all the works and all the religious duty he used to do is really a polite thing of what the Greek really means there. It really means things like dung. I count it all as like dung. I count it all as uh, the English word manure, horse poop. In light of everything we have in Christ, everything else I've been doing religiously is that 
compared to living in Christ Jesus. So what's the, what's the habit we need to fall into? What's the habit we need to intentionally do each day is we need to remember every day what matters most. When we wake up in the morning, I need to remind myself what counts and what doesn't count. How should I not be distracted? What should I use my time on? What is inconsequential in life? What is consequential? What is petty or trivial? What is really going to make a difference? Because we often chase and spend so much time and energy on stuff that's never going to matter. In this country, there's so much abundance and, and opportunity that we often find ourselves running after stuff and running after stuff. I can't remember the person who said it, but they said, whoever wins in the rat race is still a rat. I guess it's true. And then sometimes we just find ourselves like, why are, we, why are we doing all this? Why are we trying to achieve all this? Why are we trying to earn all this? And we used to be so peaceful before we were trying to do all that. We used to have more margin in our life before all of this. And you can name the things that you've fallen in. It's sort of ridiculous when we look back and we look at what we've tried to hold on in life or what we've worked so hard to achieve in life or have in life. You know, this last, or the summer before last, we went to Mount Rushmore with my family across the country and went to different, different museums and things. And I remember one of the museum uh, little captions that struck me from a, a beleaguered, beleaguered prospector. You know, it was just, looked like he was down out in the picture and things, but it, it had, had a saying that he had, he had said written in his diary. He, he writes this uh, from a century past in, in American history. He says, I lost my gun, I lost my horse, I'm out of food. The Indians are after me, but I've got but I've got all the gold I can carry. It's kind of a commentary you know, like sometimes on situations and circumstances we're in today. I, I've lost everything. I got this. My family's, you know, mortgage my family, mortgage my marriage, mortgage this, but man, I'm making good money. Have you ever taken back by how small a thing is that happens to you in a day that can derail or steal your joy? Someone cuts you off on the freeway or in the, still on the street. Someone acts in a disrespectful way. Someone doesn't seem very appreciative of all your efforts, whether it's a colleague or someone in your home or your spouse, and, and, and you just feel slighted. Some it's just as, as small as a bad hair day or that your clothes don't fit like they used to and it just kind of gets you down and derails you and you're like, Man, and it's at these times you need to stop and go back to that habit of, hey, what really matters most? Is this going to matter tomorrow? Is this going to matter a month from now? Is this going to matter five years from now? Is this going to matter a hundred years from now? And as you get up the, the, the scale, is this going to matter for eternity? As Jim Elliott said, he's no fool that spends this life spending it on something that outlasts him. What is it that matters to you the most? Is it your career? Is it security? Is it your spouse? Is it your kids? Is it power? Is it being admired by people and looked up to? Is it church? Is it, is it a relationship with God? It's amazing to me that after all that's been said on the emptiness of material gain and holding on to things and trying to live this life or all the different things are just so earthly that there's still this rampant example of persons that use people and love things instead of love people and use things. Uh, we live in what many commentators are calling the age of disposable relationships. It's like, wow, I don't like it. <laughs> if you're not happy, get out. I'm so amazed, like in some counseling sessions, I've been, out to, been with people and said, you know, this is going on, this is going on. What, what do you think about that? You know, what are you, there's some destruction in those relationships and things. It's like, well, I don't know. I just know that God wants me to be happy. It's like, you know, I'm just, I know what God wants. God wants you to be more like his son, Jesus. And I think that will make us happy. <laughs> I don't think God's goal for your life is that you're just happy in this world. Especially following and doing destructive, destructive things. They're not going to make you happy. It's the point to where sometimes we just, there's a funny commentary kind of on this idea of just, wanting things and using people a group of friends went deer hunting and they paired off in two by twos and that night one of the hunters returned alone staggering under an eight point buck and one of the campers said hey where's harry harry had a stroke of some kind he's a couple miles back up the trail you left harry laying there and carried the deer back tough call nodded the hunter but i figured no one's going to steal harry 
to some kind of just commentary again on disposable relationships. What's the actual negative habit here that Paul is pointing out that needs a positive habit? The negative habit is pop culture. The culture all around us just and you can't get out of the culture you're in the culture you're swimming in the culture it's all around you and everywhere you look and everywhere you are there's this message these advertisers saying that if you don't have this product if you don't have this gadget for our, our, our teenagers and young people if you don't have the newest iPhone if you don't have this Bluetooth capability then you're nothing you're behind you're you're kind of out of this the scene you're not with the cool you're not with the popular you're not with what's best you're not getting that for your kids for Christmas? How dare you? That's almost like child abuse, not giving them the newest game box. Sad to me that people will feel sad or depressed as they compare themselves with the neighbors. I always say that saying, buying things we don't need with money we don't have to impress people we don't like. So listening to the pop culture will never satisfy us in the way that if we see Christ and the, the rubbish of everything else in comparison, in comparison to what Christ has for us, what he wants for us, the joy that is everlasting. Verse 10 says, I want to know Christ and experience the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one way or another I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Paul says here he wants to know Christ. He want, not only wants to know him, he wants to experience him. He wants to experience the death and resurrection. He wants to suffer with them. I know so many times, uh, you know, we in our culture and things will say, I know them. I know that person. It's because we've seen him on TV. I know the, who the Kardashians are. I know Tom Cruise. I, I know these. It's because I've seen their movie. We don't know anything about them. We don't know uh, what they're like, what their favorite things are. We don't know their personality. We don't know what their character is. Paul says, I not only want to know about them, I want to know, I want to experience Christ. I want to suffer with him. He doesn't say one way or another I'm going to suffer with him. He's not saying I, I might resurrect or I might not resurrect. He's saying he doesn't know the way he's going to, whether he's going to be martyred real soon because he's in prison or whether he's going to be raised from the dead and have, have a death of natural causes later on. Paul's experientially connected to Christ. So what's the habit here that we need to put in place each day? Every day we need to get to know Jesus better. Paul said, I want to know Jesus. Constantly different ministry updates that I, I get sent to me by email all the time, and there's some marriage uh, updates I get specifically on marriage ministry. I received one this last week, uh, and in, in the, uh, the caption of, about the book, he said, this author discovered the number one uh, secret to marriage long longevity. Well, so that gets your attention. Like, wow, the number one secret of marriage longevity. I, I want to know what that is. And, and, and you read the caption from the book, and it says, you, you have got to keep on dating your spouse weekly. And in my mind, I'm thinking, oh, wow, that's a secret, duh. You know, you got to, like, go on dates with your spouse weekly. And then I thought, but man, this fall, I haven't gone on a date weekly with my spouse. Uh, Kelly was busy starting a new school year, and me and a teacher, our do all three daughters, different soccer schedules, and then there's the church schedules and things, and I could make all the excuses in the world, but I could say, you know, I can see how there's a creeping separateness that is natural, but the world is tugging away from marriages and relationships. And... and I would say it stands the reason that if you want to draw close to someone, your spouse, your kids, your grandparents, your grandkids, there's a need to spend time with them. And as you spend time with them, the relationship is going to skyrocket and get closer and get better because of the time spent together. And what do you think happens when you begin spiritually? Not just spending, not spending hours each day reading your Bible or in prayer with the Lord, but even 15 minutes a day. What if you just began to be dedicated just a few minutes a day? Maybe start with just a scripture verse to meditate on and, and, and finish with a prayer. Do you think that's going to build your faith up? Well, I think if the culprit for relationships many times being starved to death uh, in marriages, it certainly holds true that in a relationship with the Lord, you can be starving your faith. By never being in his word, never being in prayer, never really taking the time to get to know him. And you can see that your joy would be affected that. Because in Nehemiah 8.10, it says, the joy of the Lord is my strength. 
The joy of the Lord is my strength. The, the rocket fuel that I need to get done, all the things I need to get done in my day is, is the joy that I have from knowing the Lord. It's not just uh, always just getting enough sleep. It's not just the food I eat. It's not all the just uh, other balance in my life. I think it's actually the joy himself of, of knowing the Lord is my strength. It's not lifting weights. It's not uh, other things just to work out and feel more vibrancy. It's not taking any pills or anything. The joy of the Lord is my strength. Well, what would be the trap? What would be the negative habit of not spending time getting to know Jesus? Well, the trap, I think, obviously, you probably already, is busyness. How do we get so busy? How do we let busyness just creep into our lives and take time away from our relationships that are most important, relationships in marriages and with kids, but also a relationship with the Lord? And I would say at this church, we, we have a plan to inspire. It doesn't replace the daily a time that a Christian needs to spend with the Savior, but we do. You can look in your bulletins, and you see a plan that says gathering together. We gather together on Sundays for worship. And, and you know, if nothing else, as Carrie has said, we need to be a, a place of worship, worshiping the Lord and magnifying who he is and, 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 and seeing who we are in light of him. And, and secondly, not only just gathering together and worship, though, but going deeper and actually uh, finding fellowship and, and, and discipleship and getting in the word of God together and getting to know one another better and who's, what needs of the people are around you. But you're getting to know Christ as you're serving and meeting. And then hopefully throughout the week, you'd find a, a journey group to live life together, to serve, to minister, and even evangelize. And again, it doesn't replace the daily getting to know Christ on your own, where you become ultimately a self-feeder. But it does hopefully inspire that, hey, this is important to the church for you, and it should be important to you personally. Put this habit in your daily life. Start with one verse. Start with a, a prayer. Paul goes on to say in, in verse 12, I don't mean to say that I have already achieved these things, or that I have already reached perfection, but I press on to possess that perfection for which Christ Jesus first possessed me. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing, forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. You notice here that Paul says, I'm not saying I've achieved these things yet. He's saying, I'm not perfect in this. There's just an honest statement from any one of us Christians. I'm not perfect in this. And so what's the, the truth here? What's the habit you and I need to do that Paul is doing here? And the habit is we need to review every day where we still need to grow. When you say that if there's anybody who really knows and is living the Bible, it's the person that probably wrote much of the New Testament, it would be Paul. If there's anybody we might say that has it together, who's, who's, who's achieved, who's arrived, it's, it's the Apostle Paul. Well, Paul, I think, would encourage each of us, because he says, I haven't arrived. He encouraged each of us to reflect on our lives on asking, how do we need to grow? How, we need to ask our, each, each day or each week, Lord, what are you teaching me today, this week? How consistent am I walking with you? Do I trust you more today than I did yesterday? Do I trust you more this year than last year? What is the evidence of that? Can I see changes in my life? Can I see new attitudes and different perspectives that are more godly than, than the godless ways I used to think? Most of us live our lives just going a million miles per hour, and we need to intentionally take time to reflect on these things to grow in Jesus. The Bible says in Psalms 139, 23 through 24, Search me, O God, and know my heart. Test me and know my anxious thoughts. See if there are any offensive ways in me and lead me in the way everlasting. Look at me, Lord, and reveal to me where there's something that's not right right here. Maybe it sounds counterintuitive for joy to occur, to be one who says to the Lord, Hey, do an EKG on my heart spotlight on me where I might need grow and need to grow. Show me where my sin is. Show me where there's offense in me. Show me where my heart is sick and where I need more of you. And it might be counterintuitive, but there's really actually joy in the humility it takes to acknowledge that you need growing. There's actually joy in humility where you don't have to wear a mask. There's joy in those people that are just comfortable in their own skin to say, hey, look, this is, this is who I am. This is what I think. This is uh, and, and this, what, what do you think of me? Because this is it. You, know, you can know you're at least dealing with me. There's no pretensions. There's no hidden agendas. It's just a, a humble a person that's able to say, this is me. 
Well, it kind of shows what the trap is or the negative habit that can take us away from that habit, and that's the trap of pride. As many of us, we, our pride tells us, hey, we are already just fine. We don't need change. We don't need other growth. We've got it together. Or we're, we're as good as the next guy. We're as good as the next gal, and everybody around me will still know that we have growing to do, right? People can look at us and see, hey, there's some brokenness there. So oftentimes we don't see the brokenness in us, but our, our friends and those people closest to us, our spouses and kids, they certainly can see the brokenness in us where there needs to be changes or there needs to be growth still. At the turn of the century, uh, Blockbuster, uh, the video story, you guys remember Blockbuster, and the guys in the blue suits and stuff and a little blue card with yellow on it, Blockbuster video, and you could rent DVDs and videos and things in there and Back at the turn of the century, at their highest point, they had over 9,000 stores in the U.S. And uh, DVD line shelves and uh, membership card with a little blue number on it. And, and, and uh, Reed Hastings, back at that time, was the founder of the fledgling startup called Netflix. And he met with Blockbuster CEO John Antico in 2000 to propose a partnership between the two. And he was laughed out of the office. He said, your ideas will never work. And so... Despite the changing consumer preferences, Blockbuster doubled down on its store-first model by offering popcorn, books, and toys, while Netflix experimented with a subscription model and no late fees. And only 10 years later, Netflix became the largest source of streaming internet traffic in North America during peak hours, with over 20 million subscribers, and Blockbuster declared bankruptcy. You know, we can see example one after another of just organizations, businesses, unwilling, uh, not reflecting, not acknowledging that the times are changing, that are going, things are going a different way, that there needs to be some review and reflection. A person that is humble, a person that is teachable, is a person who is still is willing to grow, is a person filled with joy, a person that knows they need the Savior each day, and to walk with the Savior, it suggests movement. When you say, well, you know, how's your walk with the Lord? And if I ask you, how's your walk with the Lord? It insinuates movement, that you are moving closer with the Lord, that you are walking with Him. Too many of us are like the story of a mom who heard a thud in the middle of the night, and she goes to her son's room, and he's fallen out of bed, laying on the floor, and she said, how'd you do that? And he replied, I, I stayed too close to where I got in. I think some of us as Christians sometimes, we just have stayed too close to where we got in. The Lord wants us to walk with Him. The Lord wants us to step into deeper waters, to grow in Him and, and be sanctified in Him. And growth means moving closer to Him. I would say as long as there's breath in your lungs to review your life and see how God wants to challenge you, how God wants to see you changed, how God wants you to trust Him more. Uh, I was reading uh, this last week about Francis Chan. Do you know Francis Chan? You know, a writer, author. He was a pastor of a, a mega big church in um, Southern California. And uh, he, he suddenly left that church. And he moved over to Asia to study the church in Asia for a, several years. And um, his trouble was, he said, with the American church, there's a, sort of a lid on it because there's always only going to be a limited amount of gifts being used and practiced in the church body. You know, like today, there's one speaker up here, a lot of people listening. Fortunately, we have some Bible study classes and things with a, a leader, and then we have small groups out there that are, are meeting, but there's only so many people singing and leading, uh, you know, and hopefully the whole body is participating, and there's so many ushers, and there's so many greeters and things, and so Francis Chan's looking at that, and he said, you know, there's a lid on the way we structurally do church in America, and why in the world is the church growing like gangbusters over in Asia and South America and uh, other places in the world? And so he studied that. Well, they have home churches of 10 or 15 or 20 people in them, but there's millions of them. And it's really a good model, especially in places where they're facing persecution because they're harder for the state to, you know, all run down and find them all and things. And there's also a need for such complex and, and intricate communication between all of the body because they're coming from all these different places, not as many just big gathering places, 
but they gather in small groups and come together for different things. And, and it's just uh, amazing. And as he's, he's saying this, and as I'm reading this, I felt like this just uncomfortable, like, that's crazy. Like, I don't know if, I don't know if I just know what that looks like. Well, Francis Chan comes back to the United States and he begins this model, and, and people are even asking him and questioning him, Francis, you're a pastor that can just walk into a room and thousands come. You can fill up buildings of, of people, you know, to, that believe in Jesus and, and have church. Why are you, like, having a study in your living room? The pastor of that church, well, he said, well, so far they've trained 47 other people that are becoming pastors of their church. It's kind of, it's just got me thinking about our journey groups and things, you know, and how, how to do church and how we how we should and, and, and really empower the people we have here. It's like, hey, you've got your home, you've got a Bible, you're the pastor of that church. Maybe we'll still gather here and things, but for the church to grow, maybe there's other models to look at and things. Maybe there's something the American church should be reviewing and studying. You know, already the 10 biggest church in the world, none of them are in the United States. And so it's, it's, it's a different... There's things that stretch us that cause us like, wow, why am I bucking? Why is that so uncomfortable to me? Is that a God thing? Is that something I need to think about a different way? And I was thinking, you know, just this week, you know, um, we, you know we've, we've helped start two churches in the last year, one in Cottage Grove and now one's getting started down in uh, Southern Oregon State University on campus. We're just able to help them get their sound system completed and things and getting ready for the, the next year. And, and then... Um, Todd Warren, one of our, our past shepherds in the past, you know, he's, this is going to be his last Sunday today, so hopefully that you'll know him, see him, and, and tell him, you know, you'll be praying for him and things, but he's wanting to go out with this church that's all busy about starting new churches, and, he, and Todd's always had a heart for church planting, and so that's where his heart's pulling him, and he's going there, and I'm like, oh man, Lord, Todd's been such a, a good leader, he's been, you know, a, a servant, he's serving in the children's area this morning, um, I'm thinking, wow. And I just always have this, you know, nostalgia a little bit about wanting to hold on to the people that I love around me and, and not always thinking, well, God's sending these people out. Or really, indeed, bringing them in, training them up, and sending them out. And so it can make us un uncomfortable. Uh, well, Paul goes on, verse 13 and 14. No, dear brothers and sisters, I have not achieved it, but I focus on this one thing forgetting the past and looking forward to what lies ahead. I press on to reach the end of the race and receive the heavenly prize for which God, through Christ Jesus, is calling us. So part, part of Paul's memories here, memories that Paul would have would be some crazy things that he tried, he's trying like crazy to forget, such as giving permission for the stoning or execution of Stephen, one of the first deacons of the New Testament church. And Paul's got this in his memory, and you no doubt he's got some guilt. No doubt he's got some regret that he used to be Saul, who killed people in the church, and now he's Paul, the champion of the church. And so he's got all these, these regrets and things, and he wisely says, forgetting the past, looking forward to what lies ahead. Well, here's the, the habit we need to have every day in order to have joy in our lives. Every day we need to forget about what can't be changed and focus on the future. This week, there was a physical problem to the hard drive of my computer in my office, and it crashed to the point to where my friend Josh Brown said that uh, he could not recover the data off the hard drive, and so there's 14 years of sermons and record-keeping and things ever since I've been a pastor here, and uh, so he said, well, Alan, there's a company in California that does some work even for the government on on getting uh, files off of a computer with lasers and things, and he says, just a couple thousand dollars, and I said, well, I don't know all my old sermons and record keepings and things are well worth a couple thousand dollars. I'd probably have to just let that go. In fact, I said, maybe this will just give me a chance to just start afresh. And he said, well, I guess that's one way of looking at it. I said, well, you know, I think I am. I think I'm going to, maybe God is telling me not to just look past behind, but no, God is doing something new with this church, new with me today. I don't need old sermons, old record keepings and things. We can start anew today and go a whole different direction that the Lord may be calling us and forgetting what we can't be changed, forgetting what's in the past, and again, boldly going into the future that God has for us. 
now some of you are thinking, man, you know, that doesn't sound half bad for my life. You know, some of you are thinking, I, I wish that I had a button in my life where I could just erase everything that's happened to me at this point. Some like me, you know, you have, you know, I have some nostalgia, great memories and great experiences and some past successes. And so someone like me, some of you in the room, you're thinking you nostalgically hold on and grasp onto things and try and relive the past. There's some things, experiences that I've had in the past that I want to relive and hold on to. There's some here this morning that you're thinking, man, I don't want to hold, I have my, such an extremely painful past that I would rather forget. And you're allowing your past and those things that have happened in the past to affect the present and the future in a destructive way. And you can see the obvious traps there, the traps of unforgiveness, the traps of resentment, the traps of regret. For some of us that are trying to hold on to the past because we just like to relive it, the trap of tradition. Like, hey, let's just keep everything the same. Why does everything have to be new and different? Why do we have to go away, a new way? Well, Paul is saying, you know, if you want to have joy, don't forget about what can't be changed. Forget about what's in the past and focus again on the new day because his grace and mercies are new every morning. He's a God of new things. He's a God of moving forward. He's a God of, of hope. The conclusion of, of this chapter is verse 15 through 21 just kind of summarizes all this. Let all who are spiritually mature agree on these things. If you disagree on some point, I believe God will make it plain to you. There's unity and reason together. But we must hold on to the progress we have already made. Dear brothers and sisters, pattern your life after mine. Create the habits. Create the you know, the, the way of the direction. He says, and pattern it after mine. Remember, there was no Bible at this time. Paul is saying, you know, I don't have any scriptures for you already written, you know, it's the Old Testament thing, but the Old New Testament, he's going to write himself. Pattern your life after mine and learn from those who follow our example. For I have told you often before, and I say it again with tears in my eyes, that there are many whose conduct, show, conduct shows that they are really enemies of the cross of Christ. They are headed for destruction. Their God is their appetite. They brag about shameful things, and they think only about this life here on earth. But we are citizens of heaven, where the Lord Jesus Christ lives, and we eagerly are waiting for him to return as our Savior. He will take our weak mortal bodies and change them into glorious bodies like his own, using the same power with which he will bring everything under his control. You know, that was just an awesome word there. Let me take Philippians 3. And you can just live in that all of this week. And there's joy there. There's the habits, the habits of joy are all found in that scripture. Don't let the trap, don't be trapped by the enemy's lies. Don't be trapped by things that are not true. I said each day, each day claim that the habits of God, that you claim the truths, and those, those truths, let them enter into your psyche to make good decisions. Those good decisions go into good habits, and those habits are forming your character. And those character qualities that God is forming in you is shaping your future. That's what he wants us to focus on. The invitation time this morning is this. If you do not have yet a relationship with Christ, I pray you'd consider that today. That you would you'd consider praying and receiving his spirit into you this day. That his spirit would manifest the truths of him and he would live in you and you'd know him in his fullness. And your life would be changed forever in that decision, being justified, and then you can begin to live in the habits that we talked about today, empowered only by the Holy Spirit. If you're already a Christian today, my prayer is that you would live in these habits of joy, that you'd not be undone, that you would not be oppressed, that you would not be suppressed by the ugly lies of the enemy, but you would walk in joy, walk in the habits of joy this week, do these things. Listen to the Lord and how he's directing your life. We're just standing during this time. Let's just, let's just praise the Lord with all our voices in our hearts. And